Welcome to We Plus You, straight talk about conscious business collaboration. And I am really excited today because I have a return guest, Corey Jenke. And we have wonderful conversations about many things. And today we are going to be talking about, I think, a really fun topic. We're going to be talking about prescription for sanity and we're going to be talking about purpose. So why don't you start with your blog that you wrote just recently, Corey? Well, thank you, Carly, and, and hello to you. So, you know, what I've been working on for the last several months is how do we create better patient outcomes? You know, as a pharmacist, that's probably the number one goal. So many people, they, they, they've gone to pharmacy school, they've gone to nursing school, they've gone to medical school. And, you know, they really wanted to help make a difference with their lives. And that's why they got into these places. And before they knew what happened to them, they ended up throwing bags at people, pushing people through the line as fast as they could. Essentially, instead of making a contribution, they ended up just becoming a, a assembly line worker. And, and that wasn't very fulfilling. And, and so one of the things I wanted to do is, is try to redefine how do we get better patient outcomes? And I think the best answer to that is is going to have to be to try to help us healthcare professionals and really any professional when you think about it. But especially you know in the arena that I function every day, how do we get better patient outcomes? And we get better patient outcomes by helping people reframe what it is they're trying to do. And so what we did is we created a website which should be live here in the next couple of weeks called Prescription for Sanity. And, of course, whenever you're trying to have a message, what you want to do is not have it be the same old rhetoric. I wanted it to be an actual physical plan. And here's what I mean. You come into the pharmacy and you always see the pharmacist dressed out and wild and angry. And pretty soon someone from their company walks in, maybe a district manager or regional manager, and the pharmacist says, well, you know, this needs to be different, that needs to be different, and all they get is sort of this blanket uh, rhetoric answer. Well, just delegate it. And so I don't want to do that. What I want to do is have a very specific plan. So what I decided is that I want people to always think in terms of purpose because the prescription for sanity is unmistakable, unrelentless purpose. And purpose stands for prioritizing, understanding, recognizing, positioning, organizing, strategizing, and eliminating. And so that if a person can walk through those seven pieces, what they can do is they can figure out how to deliver themselves to their career such that they're actually making the difference they were born to make. And that, of course, will in turn improve the patient outcomes that we so desire. How's that sound? That sounds wonderful. And the good news is we have time to really actually take those seven steps, break them down, and give people the tools to actually walk through these seven steps. So let's start with purpose. Yeah. Let's start so, with breaking it down. Okay, so purpose is the reason that we were born. A lot of people don't really realize, but they're standing there letting their music live within them, and they're not sharing it. So what they're ultimately going to end up doing is, is dying with their music still in them, and we don't want that. What we want to do is really focus on how can I make that difference I was born to make. So we start by prioritizing. Amazing things happen when we prioritize. When we decide what are those one, two, or three things that I do that only I can do and that if I don't do them, they won't get done. And if I don't do them, they won't make a difference. And so, for instance, in the corporate world, what happens a lot is that if you're not careful and you don't really have your solid prioritizing done in a way that makes sense to you, then you end up firefighting. And what that means is that as soon as you get an email, say you got to do this, or as soon as you know you get a call, this is well, this is a high hot button priority. You start moving all around and not really focusing on what it is that you were meant to do. You know, the manager is there to manage. The third baseman is there to cover third base and if if we if we take the third baseman and let him just wander off instead of focusing on feeling ground balls we've got a problem and so the first P in purpose is really sitting down and saying okay what is it what is it that I do that I'm really 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 good at so I'll give you for instance when I'm working in the pharmacy I'm only interested in doing three things number one is connecting with a customer 
Number two is connecting with an associate. And then number three is networking with the key players in the pharmacy industry. That's the doctors, the nurses, and the professional organizations. If I'm doing those three things, then I am extremely effective. But whenever I let anything pull me away, from one of those three things, then that's where I run into problems and that's where my customers aren't very well served and that's where my associates begin to become disengaged and disenchanted and disenfranchised with my organization. And of course the key players, the doctors, the nurses, the professional organizations, those are the people that help me do what I do best. So what, what are your thoughts on prioritizing, Carly? I think that's a really key element to anything in life, is, and, and not just business, in our home life as well. Think about it. If we don't prioritize what we want to do even in our homes, we get sidetracked, we don't get our exercise in, we don't take care of our health, we don't take care of our bodies, we don't get our kids out in time for going to school, we don't even get to work on time. It is such a key factor in all aspects of life. It is extremely important. Oh, and I agree that you mentioned the exercise and so forth. So many people, and, and I, I think this sometimes sounds harsh, but so many people put other people first. And what happens is that essentially they minimize their effectiveness for the other people. In other words, they want to put the oxygen mask on everybody else and then save themselves. So, yeah, we've got to take a really strong look at prioritizing our health, prioritizing our well-being, prioritizing our time alone so that what we can do is go ahead and really be the best us when we get around the other people in our lives. Yeah, absolutely, because as you said, putting the oxygen mask on ourselves first, we can't be there for other people if we aren't our best selves first. If we're sick, we can't take care of other people. And especially if we're parents when we have children, how can we take care of our children if, if we're sick and we can't take care of ourselves? So exactly. we have to be our best selves possible so we can be there for our coworkers, so we can be there for our children, so we can be there for our loved ones. So we need to really understand that prioritize, I can't, now I'm going to even say the word correctly right now, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. We need to learn to really get our stuff in order. And that means really looking at that step as a first priority. Exactly, and that's why purpose is the word that I chose to create that around is because that most people forget that their greater purpose is to leave something within their children such that their children are able to function independently of them so that it, when they eventually move on to a different world, their children are taken care of because their children know how to take care of themselves. So all too often, we let guilt circumvent our greater purpose and, and consequently make us ineffective. Very key point there. That's very. That's a very valuable point. Now let's move on to the second letter in purpose, which is understanding. How key is understanding? Well, understanding is the the end all be all of everything. I think that understanding really when I think about it means asking the questions that will actually get us moving in the direction that makes us unique and effective. For instance, a lot of times people forget to even ask themselves, what is it that I'm trying to do and, and, and how am I trying to do it? Where is the other person coming from and what do they really value? Or one of my favorite questions that I always ask myself is, is what I'm doing right now the best possible use of my time. And of course talking to you is a great use of my time. But I think that people forget that we are not able to create value for people based on what we assume your value points to be. In other words, what I need to do to create value for you is to first find out what creates value for you and I don't get to decide that. You know, as a pharmacist, I talk to a lot of customers who say things like, well, you know, I, I can't believe my wife left. She shouldn't have left because she should understand this and she should understand that I work hard and blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? She's gone. And so you need to understand that in order to create value for her, you have to figure out what it is that creates value for her and you don't get to decide. So how we do that is by asking questions. And how we create value for ourselves is saying, you know what? What is it? that makes me want to get up early and go to bed late and that I would work on even if no one paid me to do it. And so when we look at our, at our, at our life and we actually try to understand, actually try to rise above ourselves and look down on our lives as if we were looking on a chessboard and saying, well, you know what, if my purpose is this, how is what I'm doing now 
either adding to or subtracting from that purpose. And I, I, I think that when we do that, we can make an awful big difference in our lives as far as effectiveness and as far as value for other people. What are your thoughts on that? What I'm going to add to that, though, is you have to also look into what is your passion. Because if you're not doing what you're passionate about, you're not even going to get to the point of understanding. Because you have to tie that into what your passion is. Exactly, that and that's where yeah, and that's where asking yourself a great question like, what is it that really lights me up? What is it that I would do if no one paid me to do it? What is it that I could do all day long, every day? And and when you find people that are living in your passion, that's that's why they're just so inviting and it's so exciting to hear a person just get lit up. And I don't even care what it is you're passionate about, but I love to talk to passionate people for that reason. I kept hearing you say lit up, and I wanted to, I wanted to put that word passionate because people can hear the word passion, and sometimes people, when you hear lit up, that it's like passion people can hear. It's like the lit up connection. I wanted to get that passion word in there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly it. It's, it's very important to understand what really, really, really is it that you were meant to do because I believe personally that we were all meant to do something special. But we're all unique in that meaning, and we're all unique in what it is that we were meant to do. We all have unique skills that somebody out there is waiting to hear us say, do. you got to understand, there's always someone in that moment. Somewhere, someone out there is waiting to hear exactly what Corey has to say, or even what I'm saying in this moment. You never know who's listening. You never know who needs to hear your message. And so you not living out your purpose, you not living out exactly what it is you're doing or need to do, you're depriving someone of learning from you. So you diving into that question, you diving into finding out exactly what your, what your understanding of what your purpose is, is so beautifully you know, purposeful for the universe. So really do go into that question to understand yeah. what it is that you're supposed to be doing. You know, and questions are how we learn. Uh, no one really learns when they speak, but when they ask questions and find out, you know, what's going on on the other side of my eyes, it's amazing the insights that you can gain, and it's amazing the value that you can get for yourself by just finding out what creates value for someone else. Oftentimes, it's things you would never have imagined until you asked. Exactly. Beautifully put. Let's get into the next step, which would be recognizing. Yeah, recognizing is when you take the answers from the questions that you asked when, you, when you're talking in terms of understanding and actually use them to put an action, uh, action method into, into effect. Now, I use the example in the blog I wrote about Larry Bird. Larry Bird asked himself this question. He said, how could I become the all-time best free throw shooter? And the answer that he came up with was to stand in his driveway and shoot 500 free throws every single day. And so he ended his career something like 93% accurate. And the reason he was able to do that is he looked out and recognized the opportunity that he had to succeed at what really made him very passionate. And I think it's fascinating because I know that in my own life there's been a lot, a lot, a lot of times where it seemed like just when I understood what was going on, the opportunity had been gone. And so when you reach a point to where you say, you know what, before I jump here and before I jump there, I'm going to ask a bunch of questions and then I'm going to really look and analyze the situation and say, what's really going on here? And where can I be most effective? And what is it that I can do to seize the opportunity that lies before me? And then I think it's really, really important that we also recognize our own internal status. Oftentimes, we back away from things that we really know are the opportunities we want to take, but we back away because we don't recognize the fears and the internal uh, worrisome voices that go on and say, well, you know, Cor, I don't know that you really want to get into that. I don't know if you can do it. And you have to recognize that for what it is, which is, of course, a lie. One of the most important concepts that I've come up with over the last several years is realizing that a lot of people end up exchanging their passions for their fears. In other words, instead of saying, you know what, I really want to go out and make a difference, they start making their fears their goals. I don't want to get fired. I don't want to get replaced. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to get sued. And when you're living in that space, 
and you don't recognize it, life is pretty hard. Whenever you are afraid of losing, you are going to create that prophecy. And I always give the example, if you ever watch like a college basketball game and the one team is just beating the other team badly through the first half and then the thought, you can just see the thought pop into their heads, well geez I hope we don't blow it now. And then instead of playing to win like they were doing in the first half, they start playing to not lose and they blow the lead and they ultimately lose the game. You've seen that kind of thing, haven't you Carly? Oh absolutely. I call that the saboteur. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's so important that we realize that our goals have to become our goals, and we have to see our fears for what they are, which is basically just things that are imaginary, imaginary obstacles that we only notice when we take our eyes off our goals. I think it's really important to dive into learning how to eliminate the saboteur, and it's actually recognizing, know your triggers, know what things set you off, and then learn how to deal with that. Because if you let your fears take over your life, you're going to have a very in-the-box, I'm going to say, life. And, and the thing is, you've got to realize there really is no box, and you want to be outside of the box and, and actually live beyond the box and realize there is no box. So, <laughs> no, like literally, literally start living, putting one foot out of the box, and then the other foot out of the box, and then the arm, and then the other arm, and then actually literally burst out of the box. Because if you don't, you're literally going to be living inside a box. Right, right. And, and then that, you that end up with the regret. That is, literally is not a life. Literally start, like, like going back to the other steps of rec recognizing and, and, and the questions and start paying attention to your body and to the things that set you off. What are your triggers? And start paying attention to those so you can catch yourself in those fears. Because once you start paying attention to those fears, you can start squashing them. And when you have like the little, the little angel on each side of your shoulder, you know, the little devil and the other angel, and the one with the little whisper saying, "Oh, I'm not good enough, and I can't do that," and or the one who's saying, "Well, I might get fired, and I don't want to get fired," you can start squashing all those little sounds. Oh, exactly. And I think that's an, another aspect of recognizing. And I think that recognizing that you're okay. You know, so often people want to assume that they're the only person in the world that's nervous. They're the only person in the world that gets afraid to take that big chance. You know, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is acting in spite of your fears. And so when you recognize that, you know what, I'm just as normal as everybody else. And I, I've been lucky. You know, you and I have talked in the past about different people that we've both been able to meet online, offline, at seminars and things. And some of the biggest names, some of the biggest people that are out there just doing unimaginably awesome things are afraid just like you and I, but they refuse to let those fears define who they are because they know they're not living a life of rehearsal. Very important fact. And there's a lot of people that have gone through a lot of nasty and bad things. And they've not let fear take them out. And that's the biggest thing. As the old saying goes, you know, you fall off a horse, you get back on the horse. I mean, people have had their arms bitten off by sharks and they're back on a surfboard surfing, right? Bethany <laughs> Hamilton. You know, I'm oh, serious. You, you, you literally have to, you know, conquer the fear and get back out there. I mean, she's amazing. I mean, I don't know. If I'd have, you know, that's that's pretty amazing to have your arm bit off by a shark and get back on a surfing board and go out back in the ocean. That oh takes goodness. a lot of courage, right? Oh, so, for sure. And these are amazing people. So that's the things that we have to recognize. When you have something take you out and you fall down, a business fails, whatever it is, bankruptcy, divorce someone passes away, you're a widow, whatever whatever it is, you have to get back up and move forward. Backwards isn't a life. Move forward. Next, learn from whatever you're going through, take those lessons and move forward. Oh yeah, you know, and, and that's one of the things that Darren Hardy told me right face to face. He said that you have to realize that failure is an essential part of success. You know, this man has talked to hundreds and hundreds of the top people in the world, and he said every single one of them tells him the same thing, and that failure is something that's absolutely required, and the more you fail, the closer you are. And we have to realize that, you know, the people that really do things worth talking about 
have made failures bigger than we'll ever make. So I think the thing is that you have to understand that, that getting up is just part of falling down. And when you were a little kid, you know, you fell down, you got up. You fell down, you got up, and eventually you learned to walk. I like the way Jim Rohn used to say it. How many chances did you give your four-year-old to, you know, learn how to do his ABCs? Very <laughs> you know, how many chances? And, and you know, until he gets it. And that's why, the way we have to approach success. I'll take as many chances as, as I possibly can until I get it. Exactly. And you didn't yell at your little kid when they're saying the ABCs. You gave them the chance to learn ABCs. You didn't yell at your kid when they're learning to walk. You, 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 you praise them and you, know, you, and you let them learn to walk, right? Yeah, exactly. That's how we made them healthy. Right, exactly. And that's the other thing is don't beat yourself up. You know, we didn't yell at our kids when they're learning their ABCs and they're learning to walk. We praise them. Don't beat yourself up. Treat your little, you know, treat your adult self like you treated your kids when they were actually going through those steps. Oh, I agree. I think so many of us have uh, developed a habit of speaking worse to ourselves than we would ever speak to another person. And I, I think it's just critical that you don't ever talk to yourself the way you wouldn't talk to your grandma. <laughs> I always say that or to you talk to it like an infant because you know you would never ever yell at your newborn baby. Exactly. You know, or like, or, now, there are people that have or would. I'm just saying most people would not talk to an infant like that. So nurture yourself as you did to your newborn baby. When you're holding that baby in your arms, the first thing it was born, think of that infant that you were holding in your arms and talk to yourself like that. I mean, like, really nurture and love yourself the way you did that child. Oh, I agree. You know, I always feel um, very interesting when I talk to young people. I always say, you know, how many people that I see that I went to high school with? And the answer is zero. <laughs> and so how many life-changing decisions do you make um, based on trying to impress people or based on, on people that your opinion matters and, and, and you're never going to see them again? But there's one person I can guarantee you with you're going to be with your whole life. And so you should treat that person better than you treat anyone else. And the body that you're inhabiting right now is the one that you have for that's it. So you better treat that body very well because that's the yeah. only one you have while you're here. <laughs> yeah, it's mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Yeah, you need to have a good care plan in place for your entire self. At least while you're on this planet in this incarnation or whatever <laughs> it is that you believe. You betcha. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going into positioning. So positioning is really important because positioning is that thing that we do where we put ourselves in the place that makes our unique talent, skills, and perspective the most effective most of the time. Often when we get out of position, we end up missing out on opportunities to excel. I want you to think about what happens when the goalie gets behind the net. It's very easy in business and in life for something to throw us out of position. You know, the Pareto Principle states that 20% of the things that we work on and focus on give us 80% of the results. And all too often, most of us spend 80% of our time working on the things that get us 20% of the results. So it's really important that we go ahead and position ourselves as experts and that we stick in the spot where those one to two to three things that we do really, really, really well make a big difference. And what I mean by position ourselves as experts is when you are in that space that you were truly born to be in, then you're confident and you're comfortable and you're knowing that what you do makes a difference. So like when someone comes into the pharmacy and they say, well, you know, what should I take for this or what should I take for that? If I waffle and waver and say, well, gee, I don't know, even if I agree with them, now I've done them a disservice because now they're not confident in what they're going to be doing with their own health. And I can't improve patient outcomes that way. So I always talk to my students about decide what it is that you really want to say and then say it with confidence. Don't you agree that that's important? Absolutely. If we're not, if we're not confident, they're not going to be confident. We need to show that we actually have confidence in what we're delivering so that they have confidence from us in doing what we're asking them to do. If we're coaching someone and we have any, any hint that we don't know what we're talking about or any hint of self-doubt, 
any hint of anything like that, they are not going to have any trust. And that also goes down to trust. They're not going to have any trust in us. And trust is everything with a client. Oh, yes. And I think it's super, super important that that has to come from a place of authenticity. It is okay to say, you know what, I don't know, but I will find out and I will get back to you. Said confidently and well, that's sometimes the best possible answer. But what's not okay is to kind of hem and haw and say, you know what, I'm not sure of myself. I don't believe in me, but I expect you to believe in, in me as well. And, and so it's really, really critical that you, you, you understand that you come from a position, and that position needs to be controlled by you. So always come from a position of power, always come from a position of strength, and understand that it's critical to the outcomes that you're trying to get that you position yourself appropriately and responsibly. Again, don't be the goalie that needs, leaves the net wide open. Yeah, remember, you're forming a bond with the client. You're forming a trust with the client. And trust can be very easily broken. And like you said, I always tell a client, if I don't know something, I'll be the first one to admit I do not know something. Because another thing, too, is nobody likes a know-it-all. Be honest and open if you do not know something. And like Corey said, I'll save them right away. You know what? I don't know that. However, I'll be, I'll be doing the research for you, and I'll immediately come back to you with the answer. So be open and honest about those things. Because guess what? When you actually admit that you don't know something, you're actually forming a deeper trust. Because you're actually telling them something, guess what? I do not know this. And by admitting that you don't know something, you're forming a deeper bond and a deeper trust factor. Oh, I agree totally. And I, I think it's just critical that you, you realize that you are responsible for what you say and how you say it. And people don't realize that, again, very critical what he just said there, how we say something. How we say things are so important. You can say something that maybe to others may seem, for example, critical. Some, someone, again, we can talk about feedback. Some people don't like feedback. And there's many different controversies about feedback. Some people think feedback is garbage. Some people think feedback is actually good because if you hear feedback, you can learn from it. However, there are ways to give people feedback. And we are responsible for delivering that feedback in our tonality, what we say, how we say it. And that is very important because if we say something in a mean tone, it's not really necessary to tell Corey something really nasty. I can say something to him the same, the exact same sentence in a way that he can hear it without saying something in a mean tone. It's not necessary. In fact, it's counterproductive. You know, the more that you can really take the other person into your heart and, and understand where they're coming from, what their values are, the better chance you're going to have of actually make a meaningful difference for them. And I think that's really important because it's, you know, so often people want to give unsolicited advice, want to give expertise, and if another person is not open and willing, you're really doing them a disservice. Exactly, and again, that goes back to your bond and the trust factory building with the client, and that's what you want. And, you, and again, if you're forming a relationship that's going to be causing mistrust and causing a disservice, you're not going to get the outcomes that you're seeking to have with a client or land any sort of sales or, or anything that's productive. So why even go there? There's no point to going there. It's just exactly. going, to create, it's going to create things that you do not want. It's like how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? And, and that's not the, the way you want to go. Let's get into the next factor, which to me is one of my favorite points of this, because I'm all about organizing. So let's get into organizing, because I love organizing. Well, one of the things that's really important to understand about organizing is that professionals don't wing it. So even in your own home, if you want people to take you seriously, you have to take a look at how you conduct your life, how you conduct yourself, how you conduct your thoughts how you conduct your environment. You know, because maybe you think that you're doing just fine by living a life of what we call controlled chaos, but quite frankly, studies have shown time and time and time again 
that no one functions properly in a mess. No one finds their best possible selves when they're disorganized. An organization means, you know what, how do I get myself in a place to where my thoughts are sorted out such that I know what it is I'm trying to do? How do I get my team sorted out so that each member of my team, I think this is really important, knows what's expected of them and knows how they know if they're meeting those expectations. And of course, controlling your work environment and controlling your home environment is just, it's just vital because when we don't do that, we're just totally ineffective. And quite frankly, people don't take us seriously. If we don't take ourselves seriously enough to stay organized and focused. You ever walk into a person's house and, and they don't have counters, they just have collections of stuff? You ever walk into a person's house and they haven't seen their kitchen table in years? You can't tell me that you look at that person and think, you know what, I want to do business with that person. Jim Rohn said that people shouldn't judge us by our appearance, the guy likes to say, but guess what, I'm going to give you a hint, they do. So, you know, what we have to do is we have to really say to ourselves, if I want to improve patient outcomes in my case, client outcomes in the architect's case, what we've got to do is we've got to set ourselves up in a situation to where we are the person we are marketing ourselves to be. We got to be that person that other people say, you know what, I have confidence, I have faith, and I have, yes, you said it before, trust that that person knows what they're talking about. And then that's the way we benefit people. We benefit people by giving them trust in us and by earning that trust by getting our act together. Organization is something that, like you said, you're all about. I'm all about, and quite frankly, everybody that really, really becomes their best selves is all about. Don't you think so? Absolutely, and it's it's really funny because I'm actually speaking later today about this, so that's why I was laughing when I saw that. So what I'm actually going to say is that how we treat everything plays out in all areas of our life, in all areas of our life, and you have to understand also that how it also tells people how to treat us so basically you have to understand so when people see our space it actually teaches them how we are how we actually um, how can I put this in ways that you can understand so in other words it actually shows them how we actually think we ought to be respected so if we have stuff thrown all over the floor it shows them how we respect other people and things, not just, you know understand what I'm saying? So if we're willing to throw stuff on the floor, whether it be clothes or even look at someone's car, it's kind of funny, one of the things I actually do is I meet clients not at an, our first visit won't be at their office or not even at my office. It'll be outside of the office, someplace that's close to both parties so we can have a conversation outside of the environment. So I can get a sense of outside of their environment. And then we go to their environment, whether it be the office or the home, wherever it be. And I always walk them to their car. Do you know why? So you can look at it and yes. know if the car is coming. I, 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 this, is, this is my barometer for knowing what I'm walking into. I can tell by their car, not the outside of the car, but I always wait. I always walk them to the car and wait for them to open the door. I can tell by the inside of the car if there's trash all over the floor, if it's dirty, not just the exterior, but I always know what I'm going to be walking into when I walk into their office or their home. Because every little thing that we do, whether it be our car, our home, or our office, is going to tell me, it's going to give me some sort of barometer of what I'm going to be walking into. And of course the conversation is also giving me an indicator of what I'm also going to be dealing with. How fast they're talking, you know, and also even before that, when we even did the initial consultation, how long did it take them to answer the email, the initial email? How long did it take them to answer, even return the phone call? All these little things. And then when I walk into their space, how organized it is and how, like literally, things are filthy, disor how they're actually organizing things. I can tell how they respect people and things. This is different, inanimate objects and people, but they are all interchangeable. We are actually telling people how to treat us by how we treat other things. 
Generator. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. By the way we treat our environment, other people go ahead and look and say, well, this person has no respect for their environment. They have, must have no respect for themselves. So therefore, I don't have to have respect for them. Exactly. And, and functionally speaking, you know, almost all businesses require that I have some form of information that's important to you if you're a client or a patient or a customer. And you're not going to want to share that information with me if you feel that I'm just going to lose it. I mean, so you want to really understand that you're essentially a walking billboard for the kind of person you are. Your house is a, is a billboard. Your, your car is a billboard. I'm not necessarily advocating that everything has to be hospital clean, but I want to know that you care enough about my stuff and your stuff to take care of it. Because if you don't care about it for yourself, I know you're not going to care about it for me. And now here's another step further I'm going to go. Why would I want to refer you to somebody else? Because if you, again, it's a respecting and a value system, I want to know how you're going to treat someone I refer you to. <laughs> okay, so this is what you don't get. Some, some, it's kind of funny. Someone may think it's just about organization, but it's not just about organization. Because if your place is trashed or filthy, that that trust level doesn't give me a lot of confidence that I'm going to want to refer you to another client because I'm going to feel embarrassed because I got to remember it's also about my credibility it's also about my reputation that if I send a client to you and they walk in and see this what does what message does it send to the person that I referred you to oh yes well, I wrote a I wrote a really fun blog a, a week or two ago about it's called it was called make me look smart because you know in a pharmacist we have this all the time suppose your sister comes into town and and you find out that your sister left her medicines at home well now she's like well Carly who do you use as a pharmacy and then you have to bring her to me right because you know you can't lie I mean this is where I go and you walk in and and, and you're thinking please don't make me look stupid please don't make me look stupid. And, and that's where I get this tremendous advantage because right away I'm going to treat your sister like she's the Queen of England because I know that messing up your sister's business is worse than messing up your business because you're going to have to answer to your sister for that referral whether that referral was forced or otherwise. And the organization thing works exactly the same way. If you send somebody to me and then you find out that they came and my office was a mess, you're not only going to take your business away as well, but you're going to kind of have a chip on your shoulder about me, and you're going to make sure everybody knows not to come see me. And quite frankly, it's just plain too easy to, to not take care of. You know, I mean, your personal environment is just too easy to take care of to let it go. Well, that goes back to baby steps. A lot of people get lazy. They don't do it as, in other words, clean as you go. As you're cooking, clean as you go. Filing, file as you go. Why wait to let things pile up? And the and here's where people get the what I would call it's called the the freeze moment. They see so much, they get overwhelmed. Therefore, they don't do. Okay. So why get to the place of overwhelm? And it's like hire an intern, hire a virtual assistant. There's so many tools in place nowadays that you can do so you don't get to the place of overwhelm. But that's that's why people actually get disorganized, by the way. It's because they get to the state of overwhelm. And once they get to the state of overwhelm, they're like, oh, my God, I can't handle this. And then there you go. Yeah, it's like, and or if you do have an <laughs> issue, you know that you are a pack rat or you do have an emotional issue or some kind, get the help that you need so that you can overcome that and do the steps you need to get organized. However, there's no excuse for anyone to live in filth or or whatever you want to call it. And you know, it does affect your business. It does affect your bottom line. I can get into the whole stories of feng shui and the whys of energy and everything else like that. This is not that show. <laughs> However, just trust me when I can tell you that energy cannot move through stuff. Energy or flow needs space to flow. Therefore, if you have piles everywhere, energy can't move through a house. And energy is energy, whether you, whatever you want to believe. However, yeah, it does affect your bottom line. It does affect, and actually, it affects your mood. 
really does. Your brain can't think with stuff cluttered all around you. Therefore, you get down, you get sad, you get whatever you want to call it, the blues, you get, I mean, seriously, it affects your body. It affects your health. They've actually done studies on when there's filth everywhere. Um, it actually affects your health because you get bacteria stops building up. Um, mm -hmm. There's a thousand reasons why you want to be organized and keep things clean. It's not just for organizational, sa organizational sake. It actually does affect your health. Health. It affects hormones. I mean, the list goes on as to what, why you why you want to do this. <laughs> well, and, and, and most importantly, it's controllable. There's so many factors in business and in life that are beyond your control. You can't dictate what the economy is going to do. You can't dictate what consumer preference is going to be. But you certainly can dictate the appearance and the organization of your own environment. And so if we take care of those controllable things, then we have that much more power and help us deal with the uncontrollable things. Exactly, and that is a very, very valid point. So now let's move on to another favorite one of mine. We're going to get into strategizing. I love strategizing. Well, strategizing is brilliant because what it's all about is those leadership and partnership opportunities. It's about who can I work with or who can I work through or how can I set myself up for success? I think all too often we, we enter a day with no actual plan. You know, we go to the office and we, we just are, are basically ripe for whatever emergency or four alarm fire happens to come at us. Really successful people plan tomorrow out tonight before they go to bed. They put their running shoes by the door. They put their running clothes on top of their running shoes. One of the things that, that winning people do is they walk into the office knowing for sure what it is they wish to accomplish, who it is they wish to accomplish it with, and how they wish to partner with others, how they wish to lead others to get the results that they want to get. It's not complicated, but it requires a little bit of forethought. It requires going through and actually writing down, this is what I want to get from the day. I always love the way Jim Rohn said that. He said, don't look to get through your day, look to get from your day. I know that you, Carly, are a real strategizer. Why don't you tell me your thoughts on strategizing? <laughs> oh, you mean because I have usually, I, I get this question all the time, like, oh my God, Carly, you have so many things going on. How, how in the world do you get it all done? And it is, it is, it's because I actually have a strategy. I actually have, I actually use a calendar system. I actually have to, you have to actually write things down. If you don't write things down, you're never going to get the things accomplished that you want to accomplish. And you do, you actually have to, I, now, there are several ways. Some people do write the things down the night before and, and they actually, people don't like checklists. There's, there's many ways. I use a chunking system where I actually have chunks of specific times throughout the day that I'm doing certain things. So there's times for emails, there's times for my social media, there's times for my shows, there's times for my interviews, there's times for putting together my radio packages and all that. Um, so everybody has different ways that they'd like to do it. However, definitely, you definitely need a calendar system. You definitely need, um, you, yeah, calendars are immensely, you have to have a calendar system in place. And you definitely have to allot for things. So otherwise, especially if you work from home, if you're a person that works from home and you have an outside office, especially if you're working from home. Because when you're in a home environment, there is a thousand and one things that can get you sidetracked. Whether it be your kids, whether it be you know phone calls, and, and especially now technology. You're getting tweeted at, you're getting texted at, you're getting bombarded with information. right? So you have to find ways that keep you on task. Because otherwise you can be pulled in 20 different directions. And if you are a multitasker, you have to realize that, especially if you're doing certain things, there are times when that may be okay, and there are times when it's definitely not okay. Because you ha you, you got to remember, you, your end end result is that you're delivering quality content and quality results. So you 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 know. So again, there's the whole debate about multitasking, multitasking good, multitasking bad. You know, you, you have to be someone that's immensely brilliant and someone that can use both sides of the brain equally to be someone that can really multitask and, del and deliver high quality content and high quality value. Otherwise, multitasking, absolutely not. 
and especially when you're, you know, with the client, no, 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 no. Um, you know, so, you know, I'm, I, you know, especially when you're a producer, unfortunately, you are multitasking. You, and you know what I'm saying? I'm, so I'm not a proponent for multitasking unless you're someone that's seriously in a position where you absolutely have to. You, yes, absolutely running things down the night before, absolutely in the morning, actually going down that list and making sure the prior, you know, you, know, you have to have your priorities straight because that is critical in, in that, that piece. Yeah, a lot of people feel that if they make a list of eight things to do tomorrow and they only get six of them done, then they're a failure. So that's why they don't like to make lists. But here's the thing. If you get six of them done on your list of eight, I guarantee you if you didn't make a list, you've only got three things done, if that. So it's really important to realize that, like you said, you've got to go ahead and really evaluate what am I going to do to get blocks of time in the first place and how I'm going to get those blocks of time taken care of is I'm going to go ahead and assign them as if they were an important client coming to my office. So if I block out 90 minutes for my workout, that's it. That is an unbreakable appointment. If I block out 90 minutes for my writing, I have a do not disturb sign on my door and I'm not afraid to use it. And here's the thing, a lot of people think that's harsh, but what happens is that when you get together with your family and friends, you're that much better because you're where you're at all the time. You're with them because you know you got your writing done. You know you got your exercise done. You're not sitting there going, well, every time I'm with the kids, I think about the office. Every time I'm at the office, I think about with the kids because when you block out time and you stick to it, you actually create strategies to get things done and stick to those. You're, of course, going to have disappointments because the clock does tick very quickly, but you're always going to be able to be where you are at all times. And I think that that's probably the number one definition of happiness. If I can be where I am and enjoy the moment, then I'm doing pretty well. And multitasking, you're right. There is really no such thing as multitasking. There's literally switching. Because, as you said, you can't really use both parts of your brain at the same time. So studies are pretty clear on the fact that when you try to switch, you're much less effective than when you go ahead and focus single-mindedly on one item until it's blocked off and gone. It's amazing what you can accomplish. Most people have not ever had that experience of trying 90 minutes with no Facebook, no email, no telephone. For instance, my office is in my basement at home. My cell phone is not allowed down the steps. It's just not. And it's amazing, once I put that rule into place, how much I can get done. Also, I, when I don't take my cell phone to on my lunch at work, it's absolutely amazing how many pages I can get read versus when I bring it, for whatever reason, just out of habit, you fiddle with it, and your page read count goes down probably 75%. Isn't that sad? It is. Technology has, you know, <laughs> technology has connected us in many, many ways and disconnected us in many, many ways. Um, you know, you go out to restaurants, everyone's fiddling with their phones. So, you know, it's really sad in a lot of ways. So families have disconnected in a lot of ways because of technology, and yet it's brought families together a lot because of grandparents and being different states, and now you can talk. So, you know, it's technology is wonderful and amazing. So, again, like I said, it's connected people in so many ways, and it's disconnected. So it's it's a dichotomy that's very interesting. But it's created a lot of opportunities for, for people who want to invest in their communication skills and their emotional intelligence. Because it's very clear when you look at the way people use items like Yelp, and online platforms like change.org. It's very clear that people want connection, but it's also clear that there's a shortage of connectors. So it becomes a very huge opportunity for business people who want to invest in emotional intelligence communication skills. I really believe that. I agree. It's, it's a very interesting time right now. And I think it's also more about us um, setting boundaries, setting boundaries within our families and, and within that aspect. In other words, setting boundaries that at when we're at restaurants, cell phones are in the purses and they're on silent. Or, you know, setting boundaries when we, when we are, when we are at certain places. You know what I'm saying? So I think it's up to us as individuals to not let it disconnect our families. And when, when it is allowable, 
you know, for certain situations. Like you said, not allowing it down your stairs or not allowing it when you go to lunch. So, and I agree. I think it's amazing technology, and I really, I think, look at us. We're doing a Google Hangout, having an interview, and we're miles and miles apart, and yet we're being able to deliver quality content to a lot of people everywhere. So, I, and I love it. I think technology has been an amazing asset to so many people, and so I, I it's brilliant. And I, you know, I, I think we just, I think we have a responsibility in some ways to reconnect our families in some way. So I think it's, you know, like I said, I think it's an interesting time right now. Yeah, and I think we now have a beautiful part. Now, we have, now we're getting to one that I also like because it's about eliminating. Well, you know, we sort of lap or overlapped with eliminating um, when we talk in terms of, of distractions. And so here's what's really important. I want you to picture a pie chart. And I want you to picture six equal parts. The six things we've talked about already, prioritizing and understanding and recognizing and positioning and organizing and strategizing, suppose those are six equal parts of that pie chart. But that pie chart has a rather thick band that runs all the way around the outside and that's eliminating. So you're eliminating distractions, you're eliminating roadblocks. You're eliminating excuses because excuses, distractions, roadblocks, they run all through and all around our lives. So I like to think of eliminating as the key component that encircles our lives like a covered wagon train covers a fire so that when we take responsibility for the distractions, for removing the roadblocks, and for our excuses, we can become ten times more effective. It's only when we let those distractions, for instance, we don't enact any policies as far as when and where our cell phone is allowed, how often we'll check into Facebook, how often we'll check our email. There's many people that will check their email like once every ten minutes, even if it doesn't ding, just in case. And it's really tricky because we have to always be the master of our distractions and we can never be the servant because quite frankly there's a war on for our attention there is no shortage of places that we can put our attention and really our attention is all that we have our attention and our decisions we make the decision where to put our attention and if we give that away we're essentially giving away our personal power so it's really important that we see eliminating as this theme that runs through everything. People say, well, you know what, Carly, I can't be positioned because I just don't have the credentials. No, nope. excuse. You know what, Carly, I can't get organized. I'll let you have this one. Carly, I can't get organized because? <laughs> I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I'm not feeling well. I have too many kids to take care of. You know, it, the, and the list is endless. Right, and of course it's all just Garbage. We know that. Even we know that as we're saying that. So what do we have to do? We have to commit to eliminating those things from our lives. And you kind of pointed at it. Part of how you do that is you take baby steps. If there is a problem in your life that's been a problem in your life for a long time, you can't just eradicate it like you've got a can of Ray to take care of your problem. But you can take those first steps and make those first steps snowball into second and third steps. A lot of times those uh, barriers that I talk about come from our physical environment, so just getting things organized, small steps at a time. For instance, you ever see a guy that's got a whole stack of magazines that he's going to read, and they're taking up space and they're draining mental energy? You know you can't read all of them. You know you've had them for a year, so you know what? How about pick one? Get rid of the rest. What's it going to hurt if this magazine that you're not going to read anyway is in somebody else's junk pile? Darren Hardy told me something else that I thought was very interesting. He said, you should unsubscribe for all of those emails that you never read. He said, yes, the, having them in your inbox is taking mental energy. So if you even look at the small things in your life that you could organize, I'm not suggesting that you unsubscribe to everything, but I'm just saying if there's things in your life that you, you aren't going to use or aren't going to do, let's get them off your mental plate and start looking at where can I take the baby steps to eliminate excuses, distractions, roadblocks, and anything else that's stealing your productivity. What are your thoughts about that? 
I think that's a great idea, especially especially with email, because I think people just subscribe, 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 and they're like, oh my god, I got so many emails. I can't get through all these emails. You know, it's just crazy. And and an email is a is a big time energy drain, as far as I'm concerned. So I think that's a good one. I think a lot of people don't take the time to actually de-junk their email. So I think that's a big one. I think that's a great one. And Corey, I think you know. What are some final thoughts you'd like to leave? Because we are definitely coming to our end here. I, we we actually really did go through our time. It, it's really amazing how that happens. And, and that's a really good point as well. I think that's the big point. Time flies. And if you want to live a life of unmistakable, unrelenting, undeniable purpose, You've got to take responsibility for your time and you've got to figure out what is it that I'm going to do that's going to make a difference. And the difference is to create that purpose. Prioritize, understand, recognize, position yourself, organize, strategize, and by all means, please start eliminating some of those excuses, roadblocks, and distractions. And you'll be surprised what a life you'll have down the road and how you can affect other people positively and get those referrals from people like Carly that will make your business grow like crazy. Corey, where can people find you since this also is a podcast? Well, you know, the best place to find me at this point is, is, is facebook.com backslash prescription for sanity. In very, very near future, there's going to be an actual website that's called Prescription for Sanity. So look for that. And coreyjanky.com is going to be live and running within the next few weeks as well. And as usual, everybody, I always put together a page that will have all the information about Corey and links to where you can find him, as well as his Twitter and everything else. We'll have an embedded video, an embedded podcast, and as usual, I love bringing you guys quality content, and it's been a pleasure having Corey back. As it's been a while, but usually we do get together at least once a month, and we love chatting and having a grand old time, and any valuable feedback we also love, so be, for, be sure to leave some, and there's any particular topic you'd love to hear back, hear about, we'd love to hear that as well, and as usual, Corey, it's been a delight having you, and thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule. Please be sure to give everybody loves and hugs for me. And um, blessings to everybody. And I look forward to hanging out with you next time. So for tonight, it is good night, everybody. And I look forward to next time, next week, actually, because as usual, I do a show every week. So good night, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.